From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. This is Orrin Vance. Sent me up to Osmond seven years ago, remember? Orrin Vance? Oh, the, the Zeman case? Now you got it. You know, Della, I thought a lot about coming out and killing you. Instead, I'm going to do you a favor. What's on your mind, Vance? I did all my time, and people don't like to hire ex-cons. I think maybe you and I can work out something. I haven't got any jobs, Vance. I'm not asking for a job. It sounds like double talk to me. I don't think you... Don't you give me any routine, Del. I've heard them all. You can help me and make yourself some money. It's legitimate. I don't know what it's all about. Suppose I come over and tell you. Okay. I'll be waiting for you. John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to All States Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. Attention, Mr. Don Freed, Chief Investigator. Since your office authorized me to conduct certain inquiries based on information supplied by Orrin Vance, I am billing you accordingly. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Baltimore matter. Expense account item one, 295. A phone call to Prisoner Dismissal Board at Sing Sing Prison, where I was informed that Orrin Vance had been released three days before the above date. He had completed seven years of a seven to fifteen year term for grand theft. It was an unparole release. The chaplain described him as a model prisoner with a better than average chance of remaining out of prison for the rest of his life. For that reason, I was willing to listen to his story when he showed up an hour later. Hello, Dollar. You haven't changed a bit. Come on in, Vance. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Ah, nice place you get. I like it. Sit down and tell me what's on your mind. Dollar, look, don't treat me like a con, even if I am one, huh? I'll sit down, I'll have a smoke with you, I'll talk with you. Forget the other part for a while, will you please? Okay. Have one? Thanks. Just that everybody's doing that. Even my wife. Went over to see her the first day I got out. You know what? What? Katie wouldn't let me in the house. Gave me $40, told me to go out and get a decent job. Tell you she had it all worked out. Work hard, she said. Six months, if everything's okay and you're not in any trouble, you can come home to me and the kids. If not, she said, I'm going to divorce you. What do you want me to say? I want you to offer me a seat. Invite me to sit down. Sure. Thanks again. You know, I thought about it a lot. If you hadn't been out to get me seven years ago, I'd have had you over for dinner. Maybe we would have been friends. Maybe. Look, I can't get a job, and I'll have to go in business for myself. I need a steak. That's why I'm here to see you. I talked to you maybe 20 times while you were working on that Zeman case, and I think I got to know you. I called you today because of... What I saw of you, then. I think you're an honest man. Thanks. You ever hear the Towner case in Baltimore? Towner Loan Company in 1946? Yeah. Everybody's heard about that. Million dollar theft. The insurance companies still have a reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction? If it was never solved, I suppose they do. I can help you help them solve it for half of that reward. Can you? I know two of the men who did it. Two of the six men. I talked to one of them yesterday. I'll tell you who they are, where you can pick them up, but I want my name out of the picture. Can you fix that? Yeah, probably. But I have to talk to the police sooner or later. Oh, look, this is a good thing, Dollar. And all I'm asking is your promise to keep my name out of it. Tell me how good before I make any promises. That's fair enough. They had some of the serial numbers on part of the take. Here. This is one of the bills. Why don't you check it with them? Then we'll take it from here, huh? Expense account item two, $14.85. A long-distance phone call to Chief Investigator Don Freed, All States Insurance. 
who verified that the serial numbers on the $10 bill Orrin Vance handed me tied in with the Towner Loan Company theft. I explained the information I had at hand and the source from which it had come, leaving out any mention of names. Freed talked with his boss and phoned me back half an hour later, giving me the go-ahead. Okay, Vance, you're in business. All right, how does it work? You tell me who they are, I'll handle it from here. I mean the money part. When we have something, you'll get paid for it. All I've had so far is talk. This bill could have come from anywhere. You might have picked it up at a cigar counter. Look, I got it from a man named Leonard Torpy. He lives in New York. He's one of them. Leonard Torpy? Yeah. I met him my second year at Osney. He was up on an old petty theft charge. He did 18 months. He told me to look him up when I got out. Now, this part may sound crazy, but we had a few drinks together in his place yesterday. I was weeping on his shoulder about all my hard luck, and he said, You think you got hard luck? And then he marched me into the bedroom and showed me a stack of money in a bureau drawer. He said he couldn't spend it. He gave me one of the bills. Well, must have been pretty drunk out. Yeah, it was. I got to thinking about it. I checked the bill, found out it was in the town, I think. I looked up the story in it. Torpy fits the description of one of the hold-up men right down the line. Now, we'll see. You say you know two of them. Who's the other one? Harold King. He lives in Reno, Nevada now. He runs a filling station there. He used to come see Torpy on visiting days. I saw him several times. What makes you think he had a part in the town, I think? Just from what Torpy said while he was drunk and the general description of the other hold-up men in the story. See, while Torpy was drunk, he mentioned his old partner, Harry King. He told me where he was living and so forth. Did he say anything about the hold-up? No. I told you I found that part for myself. But King is the other man. I'm sure of it. King have a record? I don't know anything about him. Okay. Where'll you be? I'll phone you. Two days be long enough. Oh, I should know something by then. Yeah, remember, my name's out of it. The police or anybody else. Sure. You afraid? Yeah. I'm a stool pigeon. Well, haven't you noticed? I'd noticed, and it worried me. So I followed him when he left my place. I was buying a package of cigarettes at the corner drugstore while he boarded the streetcar for downtown. I tagged along in a taxi to the main business section, watched him get off and head for the bus terminal. I bought another package of cigarettes while he bought a one-way ticket to New York. In the half hour before departure time, I telephoned a private detective friend of mine, Pete Florian. He appeared at the bus terminal 15 minutes later. What's the rumble, Johnny? A man over there in a gray overcoat. His name's Orrin Vance. Uh Uh-huh. He's on his way to New York right now. Maybe you better tag along, see that nobody kills him. Oh? Uh-huh. If what he told me is true, somebody might try to do just that. Stay close till he settles somewhere. I see. I haven't got any more to tell you, Pete, because I'm just starting to look into it. Find out where he's living there and contact me at this number. I'll let you know what to do then. All right. Anything else? Don't let him out of your sight, Pete. Expense account item three, 100 bucks. Retainer for private detective Pete Florian for explained purposes. I stayed at the bus terminal long enough to watch Pete board the New York-bound bus and take a seat across the aisle from Orrin Vance. (music) Item four, $8.85, plane fare, Hartford to New York. Item five, $4.50, cab fare to hotel and then to Metropolitan Police Station, where I explained my business to uh, Lieutenant Randall. Who gave you this tip, Dollar? I'm afraid I can't tell you that, Lieutenant. Why not? Because I promise not to disclose any names. But I can tell you that the source is a man who couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the case, since he was in prison at the time of the holdup. Mm-hmm. But you want me to stick my neck out and get up a search warrant and maybe take this bird Torpy into custody on your say-so? Huh? Well, you have plenty to start with with that $10 bill. Should be enough for you to look into it. That why you looked into it? Frankly, yes. Prima facie evidence. But no name? No name. I've told you all there is to know. Believe me. Let's get busy. The mug folder on Leonard Torpy showed a balding 40-year-old man with a long record of theft and burglary. There was no record for a Harold King, although he was listed as an associate of Torpy's. Lieutenant Randall wired Reno authorities requesting they locate King and hold him for possible questioning. Once these preliminaries were accomplished, Randall and I went out to the address Orrin Vance had given me. But this turned up a blank. 
The landlady informed us that Mr. Torpy had lived there, but had checked out the preceding morning. No forwarding address. The good lieutenant and I parted company outside the apartment house, and I walked back to my hotel. I was going to change clothes and grab some dinner. But the clerk waved me over to the house phone. A call had just come in. Johnny Dollar. Hi. Pete Floney, Johnny. How'd it go? When your boy got in town, I trailed him to a place on 155th Street. He's got a room with a view. It's up there now. Alone? I think so. Any visitors? No. Light went out about an hour ago. Might be sleeping. What's the number? Uh, 680. His room's in the back. First floor, number 10. Where are you? Drugstore, right across the street. Expense account item 6, 160. Cab fare to the drugstore where Pete Florian was keeping a watchful eye on my nervous informer, Oren Vance. I found the drugstore, but Pete was nowhere in sight. The girl behind the soda fountain recognized him by my description and said he'd stepped out a few minutes before. I glanced up and down the block and then spotted him standing just outside the shadow of a streetlight across the street. I walked over. Hi, Johnny. That's a room back there. Lights on? He's got a couple of visitors in there with him. Showed up about five minutes ago. Car? Taxi. They look like? One's thin, medium-sized, dark suit. The other's stocky, dark suit too. Both in the early 40s. Chopin wears glasses. Didn't make either one. Yeah. This one of them? Let me see. Yeah, he's in there. What's his name? Leonard Torpy. We better go in. Okay. Right back there. Yeah. Who's uh, Leonard Torpy? That's somebody who might want to kill Vance. Wish I knew more about what this is all about, Johnny. Yeah, so do I. It's all talk so far. I see. Better cover me. Take him over there. Okay. Okay. Who is it? Mr. Vance? Who? Orrin Vance? You must have the wrong number, buddy. Nobody by that name lives here. Well, are you sure? Positive. Why don't you try the manager? Well, I did. He said Mr. Vance had this room. And he's all wet. Good night. Just a minute, Toby. What? Hey! Tell me down! Before I went down, I heard it go off a couple of more times. Must have been six inches from my head. My eyes couldn't see and my feet wouldn't move. But I could hear. There was someone very close to me. And he was dying. Johnny. Johnny. <laughs> We'll return to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Sign up. Enroll now. Join the 7 million strong who buy United States defense bonds through the payroll savings plan where they work. The bonds you buy help keep America strong. And now, Series E bonds earn more. They give you a quicker return on your investment. Through the payroll savings plan, you'll save the sure way before you spend. So sign up. Invest more in United States defense bonds. <laughs> Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I won't talk about my operation, but I had one at the police emergency hospital. As a matter of fact, I had two. They prodded a 38 slug out of my neck and another one out of my shoulder. It was 48 hours before I was allowed to sit up in bed and talk. Naturally enough, my first visitor was Lieutenant Randall. He looked haggard, tired, worried. You say you hired this Pete Florian? Yeah, to keep an eye on Orrin Vance. Is this your tipster? It's okay to tell it now, I suppose. Yeah. Well, thanks. 
Florian died right there in the hall. Four slugs hit him. Vance is on the floor beneath you, still hanging on. You keeping track of all this? What about Torpy? Did you get him? Uh, we didn't, but Florian did. Torpy's in the morgue. The other man got away. Quite a night. Yeah. Look, darling. You're the only one who can give me the story now. Vance isn't able to talk and won't be for another three days. If then, everybody else is dead or gone. Now, what happened there? I don't know. I didn't see anything, Lieutenant. I was trying to push into the room past Torpy, and the whole world caved in. Any, uh... Any line on the man who was with Torpy? Good descriptions, but no luck so far. He heisted a car outside Vance's place. I found it two hours later, no prints on it. Some blood. He might have one of Florian's slugs in him. Yeah. We gotta land that bird. Hey, you all right? I felt awful. And Lieutenant Randall left me alone for the rest of the day. At 3.30 the following day, Oren Vance regained consciousness long enough to relate what had happened. I was wheelchaired down to his bedside. Statement enclosed. That was Harry King with Toby. King flew here three days ago from Reno. He came to my place to find out what I'd done with the $10 bill Toby gave me when he was drunk. I told him I spent it. But they didn't believe me. It was King who shot me. I've got reward money coming. I'm not going to die. He was still hanging on two days later when I left the hospital. Expense account item seven, $14. Ambulance ride. From emergency hospital to my hotel. The doctors told me to take it easy for a month and I'd be all right. I had a phone call a half hour after I started to take it easy. Johnny Dollar. Are you interested in finding Harry King? Who's this? My name's Milva King. I'm Harry's wife. Oh. You want him or don't you? Sure. I'm at Shiraz Restaurant on 42nd off Broadway. Can you meet me? Yeah. How'll I know you? You won't, but I'll know you. Your picture's been in the paper for the last three days. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. King? Yes. Hey, you look pretty weak. I feel that way. Maybe we better sit down. The small, pretty brunette woman in the nice clothes looked like anything but the wife of a bank bandit and murderer. She looked more like a housewife on a shopping tour or a school teacher on a New York vacation. I listened while she cleared up some questions I had in mind. There's a reward posted, isn't there, for that holdup in Baltimore? $10,000, yeah. Will I get it if I turn Harry over to the police? Sure. How much? Half. Oh, that isn't much for giving up your husband. They'll get him sooner or later, Mrs. King. The other half's spoken for. And this Vance man? Yes. Wait, I'm just trying to figure. What about you? I'll pass it up. $5,000 for Harry. Providing he was tied in with the Baltimore holdup. That's what the insurance company's interested in. He was in it all right. I want to get something else straight. What happens to me? What do you mean? I'm his wife. I only had a part in that holdup for the last six months. I haven't said anything. Does that make me a party to it or something? Well, you could have informed, but you couldn't have testified, being his wife. I'm arraigned. I don't want to spend all the money hiring lawyers to keep me out of jail. My company will cover that. Where's Harry? Oh, not yet. What now? I'd better get something in writing from you. Something that says your insurance company will pay me the reward and give me help if I get in any trouble. All right, I'll talk to him. This time I'm thinking of the future. I'm going to have one once this is over. I hope so, Mrs. King. I know so, Mr. Dollar. Did Harry have money he couldn't spend, too? Forty-five thousand dollars. Where is it? 
I can give you that when I give you Harry. Well, you thought of everything. I tried to. Harry and that torpy man were fools. All they ever got out of it was the marked bills. Worthless money. You don't happen to know who the other four men were, do you? No. I suppose that's what you'll ask Harry when you get him. That's the idea. <laughs> Poor Harry. How long will it take you to get things arranged? Not more than an hour. I can do it by phone. I'll call you. Okay. I gave her a 50-second start before I left the table and went out in the street. I was just in time to see her climb into a cab. I was trying to hail one to follow her when a black coupe pulled up to the curb. Come on, Johnny. Hey. Hustle it up. Light will change. How do you feel? Terrible. What is this? Well, Vance told us it was King. We checked the airlines and found out he had his wife with him when he flew in from Reno. That is Mrs. King up there in that cab, isn't it? That's who she said she was. She wants to sell you her husband for part of that reward, doesn't she? Yeah. Well, what's the delay? She wants to make sure she'll be handled all right. The money and all. Yeah. So did Vance. Don't needle me, Randall. I don't mean to. This all figures thought she might try to get in touch with you for just that reason. I don't get it. Well, that's why I put a man on your hotel. He followed you when you came to meet her today, and then he phoned me. We looked her up. Her name was Melva Thaler before she married King. Her old man had a lot of money in Minnesota, but she couldn't keep herself out of trouble and got disinherited. Money's always been her problem. It's everybody's problem. Not the way it is with her. Now King's worth a lot of dough to her. If you pay off, he's no good to her now lying somewhere with a slug in him, and he hasn't been any good to her with the marked money he got in the town or hold-up. There's something else, Randall. What? She's stalling me, I think. She said she didn't know who they were. But if she was lying and she does know who the others were in that town or hold-up, King would be worth even more money. They'd want him dead instead of with the police talking his head off. That's right. <laughs> We followed Melva King's taxi for better than 45 minutes, all the way through the Holland Tunnel and into Jersey. She finally left it at a train station in Bucks County. We watched her buy a magazine and sit down in the waiting room and begin to read it. Fifteen minutes later, she stepped into the phone booth. When she came out, I went over to the filling station phone to see if she'd phoned my hotel. Well? She wasn't trying to get me. Well, that settles it. She's contacted the others. She's going to sell to you or them, whoever pays most for him. Some operator, isn't she? Well, when you have time, look at the file we picked up on her. Sixteen arrests. One conviction for narcotics when she's 18. Well, we'll see what we will see. Didn't take long. Green Cadillac pulled up at the station. Melba King stepped out on the platform and greeted the two men who were in it. She sat in the car with him, talked for a short time, then got back out. When the Cadillac Eight, rolled away, Lieutenant 15, Randall was on the radio five, ordering seven, a pickup. Yale, five nine six. I'll pick him up right away. We'll stay with him. When Melba King caught another taxi, we were right behind her. She took it to an auto court about a mile from the station. We saw her go into the cabin marked D. Randall radioed in our location. We were about to check the auto court office when the door to cabin D opened. Standing beside Melva King in the doorway of the cottage was a pale, stocky man who looked as though his legs wouldn't support him another minute. Then she saw us get out of the car. You're hurt, King. You can't go far. I've come this far, and I'm still going to keep moving. I'm going to maybe move. It was all ready for her when she got back. Yeah. Boys, no, I shoot. You especially. But you'd be dead now. Now, I... That's funny. I thought the same thing about you, King. Please, don't do anything. Please. Shut up. Oh, no. King, listen to reason. I can tell you're hurt bad. You need help. Why don't you give it up? How much were you going to give her for me, Dollar? I wasn't... How much? Tell me. Half of it. Please, Harry. And how much will Woody and Al want to give her? 
I didn't talk to oh, him. Oh, yes, you did. I passed out this morning. You got real busy. How much, baby? You're dying on your feet, King. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to die. On your feet. Maybe I won't make it. Still still for me. This is gonna hurt. No, Harry, please. No! Yell if you want to. King, don't add another one to the... Expense account, item eight, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Item nine, eighty-five dollars, doctor bills. Item ten, miscellaneous, forty-eight dollars while in New York. Expense account total, $294.60. Remarks. As you know, the two men Melva King contacted were also part of the six who had held up the Towner Loan Company. They made a full confession and named the other parties involved. As far as the reward money goes, I think Oren Vance deserves his $5,000. And I think Pete Florian's widow deserves my $5,000. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> 